Hi, Christine. They're starting late. They're waiting for someone in traffic. David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the William G. McGowan Theater at the National Archives this evening, and a special welcome to those of you who are joining us on our YouTube channel. Tonight, we welcome a group of students from Purdue University and the Purdue Institute for Civic Communication. They're here to present the results of the first ever national poll by the Institute's new undergraduate polling unit, how competent a citizen are you? A scary topic. I'm sure the results will be informative and surprising, and I swear, scary. <laughs> this is a topic near and dear to our hearts here at the National Archives. After an overview of the poll and the methodology used, Paula Dwyer from Bloomberg View will lead a discussion with the students and take questions both from our audience here in Washington uh, and those of you elsewhere by way of Twitter. It's most fitting this discussion takes place here at the National Archives as the promotion of civic literacy through our documents and programs is one of our most important missions as an agency. For years, our popular education programs have made history and civics more engaging and more educational for students and teachers. Before we get to tonight's program, I want to tell you about two programs happening next week in this theater on Monday, May 18th at noon. Author Dwight Messmer will discuss and sign his new book, The Baltimore Sabotage Cell, German Agents, American Traders, and the U-Boat Deutschland during World War I. And on Thursday, May 21st at 7 p.m., we have another program relating to our current exhibit upstairs 
in the O'Brien Gallery, Spirited Republic, Alcohol in American History. We'll be looking at Boardwalk Empire behind the scenes of the HBO series, a panel including uh, Gretchen, act actress Gretchen Moll, author Nelson Johnson, executive producer Terrence Winter will discuss the creation of the series and the methods used to recreate the historic events in Prohibition era Atlantic City. City. If you want to know more about these and all of our upcoming programs and events, there are copies of our monthly calendar in the lobby as well as sign-up sheets where you can receive it in regular mail or by email. Another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities and there are membership applications in the lobby. And a little known secret that I keep telling everyone about, no one has ever been turned down for membership in the foundation. <laughs> and now to get started and to, and to introduce tonight's program, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Katie Cahill and Robert Kulzik. Katie is a PhD candidate at Purdue University in the Department of Political Science. Her major field is public policy with minor concentrations in comparative politics and public health. Robert is, completing, is currently completing a PhD in political science from Purdue. His dissertation examines the role of state economic bureaucrats in the process of financial liberalization. So please welcome Katie and Robert. Good evening and welcome, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. We appreciate it very much. Robert and I are both graduate students for the Purdue Institute of Civic Communication at Purdue University. This past year, we've had the pleasure of assisting Ambassador Carolyn Curiel, Executive Director of PICC, and a professor in the Brian Lamb School of Communication in guiding students through the drafting, implementation, and analysis of four national polls that examined what Americans know, how they participate, and what they think about the state of the nation. The idea of giving students an opportunity to learn in and about the real world began more than five years ago when Ambassador Curiel created the first Washington, D.C. program at Purdue. Since then, using a grant from the Daniels Fund of Denver and through the support of key partners, including Purdue's College of Liberal Arts under the direction of Dean David Rheingold and the Purdue ICC advisory team, the Purdue Alumni Association, Penn Schoen Berland, and C-SPAN, PICC has evolved and grown, leading us all to this moment and to this stage tonight. We have also been blessed with wonderful students who are sitting amongst you in the audience tonight, as well as their families. Families of our students have supported us in so many ways, and we appreciate their time, efforts, and energy. We would also like to especially thank Terry and Sandra Tucker, grandparents of PICC student Allison Tucker, as well as the family of Caitlin Harris, another one of our PICC graduates, for their generous donations that fund our PICC activities and our, and our student scholarships. If the PICC advisory team, partners, donors, parents of PICC students, and the ambassador would please raise their hand, we would like to congratulate you on all of your efforts and on helping these students achieve what they have done so far. The students in the PICC polling unit come from a wide variety of backgrounds and majors. As Katie noted, the students developed four polls, a pilot poll using questions adapted from the U.S. naturalization test, and three additional polls on civic knowledge, civic participation, and civic confidence. To start, the students developed hundreds of possible questions and through a long collaborative process decided which questions and responses should be included and how they should be worded. Using their perspective as undergraduates to bring out unique aspects of public opinion. With the help of our partners at Penn Schoen Berlin, the questions selected by the students were included in online interviews to which more than 4, 
1,500 people responded. The results were then weighted by Penshone Berlin using census data in order to generate findings that are representative of the American population. Through a process of critical thinking, trial and error, and involvement in every step, the PICC polling unit has had an extraordinary opportunity to take a project from concept to completion. Robert and I are pleased to have known and worked with these students and have been inspired by the ambassador's continuing passion to help them grow. And now, without any further ado, I would like to welcome Mason Arnoldi and Cecilia Dizovi of the polling unit to the podium for the first presentation. Good evening, everyone. My name is Cecilia Dizovi, and I'm graduating from Purdue University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Public Relations and Strategic Communication. I'm Mason Arnoldi, a senior in Aeronautical Engineering. Both Cecilia and I have been a part of the PIC, of PICC for about a year and a half, as well as the polling unit since its start this past fall. Mason and I analyzed the first two polls, which covered civic knowledge. The first poll, which was taken in October, asked questions drawn from the U.S. naturalization test, the same questions administered to immigrants seeking American citizenship. The second poll, taken in January, was composed of questions created by us, the undergraduates, to address what we thought covered the most important aspects of understanding our civic society. The first poll consisted of 10 questions, while the second was composed of 20. While most of the questions were answered correctly by a plurality of respondents overall, Americans only answered two out of three questions, or 66%, correctly. That's a D plus. So that's passing, but barely. In a separate sample, one question that seemed to stump Americans was regarding net neutrality, the principle that all internet content is delivered at the same speed. Despite its coverage in pop culture, such as on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart and John Oliver's show last week tonight, most Americans thought that net neutrality meant that the federal government did not regulate the internet. Generally speaking, in the knowledge section of our poll, we found that the average American would just barely pass the naturalization test, answering just seven of the 10 naturalization questions we included correctly. To pass, like any typical grading scale, you need to answer six of 10 questions correctly. Older Americans, age 50 and above, demonstrated that they are more knowledgeable than younger Americans, answering 80% of questions correctly. Younger Americans, age 18 to 34, scored 60%. While it appeared that those with, with, with higher household income were more knowledgeable, the true determining factor was education. This is interesting because it suggests that you can't buy civic knowledge. It has to come from education. In some cases, those with high levels of education were more than twice as likely to answer correctly compared to those with less formal education. Race and gender were also significant delineators in the data. White Americans, on average, answered correct questions correctly more often than than black Americans and Hispanic Americans. Also, men did better than women by a large margin on some questions. We will more deeply explain our results from these polls in a panel discussion with our moderator later on in this presentation. But next, let's hear about the poll on civic participation and its results. Hello everyone, my name is Haley Sands and I am a senior graduating with an honors diploma in political science. My name is Rachel Bibbler and I am a senior studying mass communications. In the participation poll fielded in March, we asked a total of 20 questions that aimed to measure how frequently Americans participate in their community and their democracy. We found that the way Americans participate is dependent on various identities, such as party identification, 
age, and race. First, we found differences among party identification and ideology. The way Americans participate in their community and how they show support for political candidates differ significantly across the ideological spectrum. Democrats were more likely to participate in local programs and initiatives. Republicans are more likely to show support for political candidates or their party by talking with family, friends, and neighbors. Independents were the least likely to demonstrate support for political candidates or parties, although in the previous poll, independents were more knowledgeable about politics. Second, age was a significant section in our poll. When asked the best way to affect change, Across all age brackets, over half of Americans responded voting. However, older Americans, 50 and above, were most likely to agree with voting as a key mechanism, while younger Americans, age 18 to 34, were more likely to select volunteering and participating in social movements and protests. Younger Americans were also more likely to feel that their vote does not make a difference. Third, we saw some interesting differences among race. Black Americans are more likely to believe that it is every citizen's duty to vote. However, Americans overwhelmingly agree that the voter turnout is too low. White and Hispanic Americans most often reported participating in environmental initiatives. Black Americans most often participate in poverty relief, mentoring, and education programs. From the results of our poll, we can better understand how Americans participate in our democracy and the places where there are still gaps. We will further analyze our results in the panel discussion. Next, we will hear about the poll on civic confidence. Good evening, everyone. I'm Allison Tucker, and I'm graduating with an honors diploma in communication in Spanish with a minor in political science. And I'm Frank Speak. I'm graduating with an honors diploma in political science and history. And the both of us have been involved with PICC for the past two years. In the confidence poll fielded in April, we asked a total of 22 questions that aim to measure how Americans perceive their opportunities, the future of the country, and how confident they were in their government. With this poll, we found three overarching themes. How politics drive opinions in the state of the nation, how education is important, but sometimes unattainable, and, American, and how Americans doubt the government's ability to properly govern. First, given the current climate in our nation, were the differences we found in responses among party lines. Democrat and Republican respondents differ significantly in their governmental concerns such as how they think the government should be spending money, how America is divided and united, which branch of government they trust the most, and who they believe the government protects the most. For example, Democrats are twice as likely to say that the nation is divided by wealth, while Republicans are twice as likely to think that politics divides the country. Americans across party lines believe that the government cares most about protecting big business over other interest groups, including small businesses, individuals and families, and labor unions. However, Republicans are four times more likely than Democrats to say labor unions were the main beneficiaries of government protection, and three times more likely to think that immigration is a main threat to American jobs. Moving away from partisan differences, overall, Americans agree that higher education is essential with three out of every four respondents saying that higher education is not only necessary, but if they could give a young person $50,000, they would advise him or her to spend the money to further their education over starting a business or investing the money. As undergraduate students, we all agree that higher education is key to our future, so this is encouraging to hear. However, a third of Americans also believe that higher education was unattainable. This indicates that a significant portion of our citizens believe that they cannot receive the education they value for their future. Our generation thinks that this is a key issue, with over one-third of 18 and 34-year-old respondents stating that the federal budget should increase its spending on education. Perhaps most noteworthy was our last trend. 
Among respondents, there's a strong sense of pessimism towards the American system and United States government. Less than half of the respondents believe that the American system gives them the opportunity to be successful. And over a third of respondents do not trust our three branches of government to make the best decisions. Only about half of our respondents strongly trust our healthcare system to provide them with the best quality of care. And half of Americans do not believe our government is prepared for an unexpected catastrophic event, such as a terrorist attack or natural disaster. These are some staggering numbers. All in all, these were the three trends that stuck out to us the most for civic confidence. We will discuss our further findings in the panel discussion. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jonathan Goodwin, and I'm graduating with an honors diploma in political science. Joining us now to moderate the discussion is renowned journalist and fellow Boilermaker, Paula Dwyer. Currently, Ms. Dwyer serves on the editorial board for Bloomberg View, writing about economics, finance, regulation, and politics. Her career, spanning over three decades, has seen her write and edit for a variety of outlets and in a range of top positions. She's led the London Bureau of Business Week and acted as the deputy business editor for the New York Times, where she managed coverage of the 2008 financial crisis and the federal overhaul of health care. Ms. Dwyer was also a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 2012 for editorial writing and co-authored a New York Times best-selling book with former Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman Arthur Levitt called Take on the Street. In addition to her professional responsibilities, she has served as a key contributor, advisor, and mentor for PICC students. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Ms. Paula Dwyer. So good evening, everyone, and thank you very much, Jonathan, for that nice introduction. So um, we're just getting started here. The, um, the panel presentations were, were great, but now we're going to go a little bit of a, take a deeper dive into how the um, students think about the poll results. So they're gonna, I'm going to ask them some pretty tough questions so that they can um, you know, use the poll results to, to think about how to solve our problems today. Um, to think about what, what um, government can do, think about what the education system can do, and so forth. And I also want to ask them about their experience in, in um, pulling this poll, these polls together and uh, how it might help them in their own careers. So, Jonathan, I'm going to start with you. Um, when you first learned about the polling project, what went through your mind? Was it, oh, that's going to be a breeze, anybody can do a poll? Or was it, holy cow, I don't know anything about polls? Well, my first thought, honestly, was, does the country really need another poll? <laughs> but once the ambassador explained more about the poll, the dimensions it would analyze, the kinds of questions it would ask, and that it was the first national poll being led by undergraduates, I realized the necessity how, of this poll, how vital these kinds of questions are, especially coming from people from my generation, the so-called millennials. So I, I think this poll is, I found this poll to be extremely necessary to understanding the, the country and how we feel and how we participate. and it. My experience, um, I've had experience with polls, so I thought it would be pretty easy. And in the, um, in the end, was it easy or was it difficult? It actually was a lot harder than I imagined. Uh, the key word, I think, to this whole process has been innovation, whether it's the fact that we're undergraduates, the fact that we're so young, or the fact that we're Purdue. We've tried to make this process something different, something landmark. At every stage, we were evaluating not only the, the product we were producing, but the process we used to make the questions. And so we went back to the drawing board and scrubbed everything we had multiple times and made it quite the experience. All right, so um, Rachel, in the civic participation poll results, I was disappointed when I saw that a third of the respondents rarely interact with people in their community and fewer than half participate in local programs. Are we becoming more isolated? And might this have something to do with the fact that we're always on our personal devices and communicating pretty much through social media? Absolutely, thank you. This is a problem. We have entered an age where the evolution of technology is taking over our daily communication. 
not only face-to-face -face communication, but interaction with our neighbors, people in our communities, and simply just saying hi to others when you open a door. It's created this new paradigm where we're more isolated, truly. It, it, it's difficult to have a long conversation with someone face-to-face, -face. and I would argue to answer your question, it is stemmed from um, the advances of technological devices. So is our civic discourse threatened by technology, or is there some way that technology can maybe advance civic discourse? I would argue it is threatening to civil, civic discourse. It is something that technology will not go away. Um, I want to say that the evolution of technology has improved and I have high hopes for the future. However, it is disappointing to see the results and know that the millennials among younger generations are using iPads at age two, are getting a cell phone at age six. This is a problem that our nation is facing. While I am an optimist, I do hope that we can find a way to okay. resolve this. Um, Allison, uh, so in the Civic Confidence Poll, Americans were divided over many things, um, whether, you know, it was, um, whether we're more divided by race or by wealth, but the one thing that they weren't divided on, it was across all parties, is what government most protects, and most people said that's big business. What are your thoughts on that? Well, yes, thank you. There were three areas that respondents said that our country is divided by that is wealth, race, and politics. But over the past couple of years, it's been big in the news that you see the top 1% of income bracket controls the vast majority of the economy or money. And that has been mentioned in a lot of different political campaigns, especially the past two or three presidential elections, it's been mentioned, how do we fix this income inequality? And so I think it's really easy for the population to attribute, when the government's talking so much about it, that they're protecting these big businesses with that high level of wealth. And mm -hmm. so it's not always the government causing that and or protecting that, but it's easy when it's such a big focus. So this is how people are processing mm -hmm. this idea of inequality, that, that uh, it's, it's coming because the government is protecting yes. big business. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right, well, Cecilia. In the classroom, as you met, uh, and you were deciding on the questions to ask, how hard was it to arrive at a group consensus? Um. <laughs> I don't know if you guys would agree with me on this, but I think that was probably the most difficult part of the entire process. So for each poll that we did, obviously, as it was said before, we wrote all of these questions. And not only did we write all of these questions, but we wrote all of the answer choices that went with the questions. And so we came in for one poll with 400 original written questions by us, and narrowing down the first 300 was probably the easiest part of the whole thing, but then the last 100 that we had to narrow down to 20 was really difficult because not only did we want to make sure those questions were not leading or biased, but we also had to make sure we had the right answer choices to have what we wanted to measure. So we wanted to have enough answer choices, but not too many, and make sure those were also not leading. So I think narrowing everything down and coming to a consensus on what we all thought was the most important thing to measure was probably the hardest part of this whole project. Can you give us an example of something where you uh, really were going at it in the classroom? Um, yeah, actually I remember one specific question, not to pick on you Frank, but I remember one specific question um, about whether the American system gives us the full opportunity to be successful and we could not figure out a way to ask that question that was not leading or biased. Mm -hmm. And we sat probably for about an hour and looked at that question and how to write it so it wasn't leading or biased, and then after that, we just kind of were like, this is the best it's gonna get, so. But you worked it out. Maybe there's a lesson for our yeah. Congress there. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> right. Yeah, they should be here. All right, so Mason. Um, the civic knowledge poll results, so you would give Americans overall a D plus. That is not very good. Um, is there anything in that poll that makes you optimistic? Or was it all pessimism? Well, 
a D plus uh, is not a very good grade. That means you got 30 to 40 percent wrong. But I do think there are, is some good news out of uh, what we've seen in the data of our knowledge poll. And that is that we've identified at least one way that we can change that, and that is through education. So like I said earlier, you can't necessarily buy uh, more civic knowledge uh, by earning more money. But by continuing your education, you can uh, improve on your civic knowledge. And <clears throat> one thing I'd add to that is that, uh, or another good thing kind of along those lines is that uh, we've determined that, uh, at least in some areas, Americans know the basic building blocks. So they could identify, for example, the uh, three branches of government. It was when you ask more detail and maybe where they need to be more educated is on the details. So they couldn't answer, what does the Supreme Court do, for example? Yeah. Well, um, Haley, what, um, what are your thoughts on what could be done um, on a local, state, or national level to entice more Americans into the voting booth or to participate in their democracy? Absolutely. I totally agree with Mason. The key to this is education. But it goes further than that. There needs to be an equal access and equal affordability to education. And this goes for all levels, not just higher education. Uh, we found that Americans feel that public schools are not as good of educators as private schools. So that points to maybe a need for more money to send your kids to the best school, which it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem fair. And then going off of that, there needs to be some sort of mandatory curriculum where Americans are learning about civic knowledge. So to be able to graduate, for example, maybe every high school senior has to pass a naturalization test to go out into the real world. I think that's not such a bad idea. Um, and going off of that, it's just so empowering to know more about your government and to know that you can actually make a difference. And the only way that you can know that you can make a difference is through education. Well, speaking of education, Frank, um, in the Civic Confidence Poll, about three out of four respondents said getting a higher education is essential. And yet the, the bad news is that a third of them also said a higher education is not attainable. So what should we do about that dilemma? Uh, well, that, that, that's a big question and uh, a good one nonetheless. Um, I, you know, and I think a, a lot of people um, are realizing this dilemma and certainly you know, higher education institutions. For example, um, a couple weeks ago I read an article that uh, Stanford University is uh, helping pay for their students' tuition if their family is making under $125,000 a year. Um, doing a, uh, you know, expanding, I guess, Pell Grant um, opportunities for, you know, lower income students to make higher education more um, affordable and accessible um, is a step in the right direction. And also, um, there's a there's a new um, thing that I read about is a pay-as-you-go program where you know you go out, you get your college degree, and when you go out and find a job once you've graduated, and then 10% of your income that you make that month um, is taken off and it goes towards um, applying for education. So I think the cost is um, a very overwhelming thing for mm -hmm. Americans, especially in the lower um, uh, mm -hmm. socioeconomic sectors, um, but we're moving in the right direction. All right, so I'm going to take just a little um, commercial break here and, and um, let the audience know that they may ask the panelists questions if they want. There is a microphone on each of the uh, far left and right um, aisles. Um, so if you go up to the microphone, I'll um, see you and stop and you can ask your question. Or you can tweet a question to us. It's at uh, Purdue ICC. And um, those um, Twitter questions will be sent up to us. So um, whichever your mode, uh, you may um, participate in this too. So Jonathan, back to you. Um, do you have any ideas about what the US should do about the poor state of our civic knowledge? Do you think it's state and local education? Or do you think this is something that maybe Washington should get involved? Should Congress pass a law? Should the president get involved in this? How, how important is it? And at what level should we address it? Well, I think this should be a multilateral issue where all of the governments and communities come together, federal, state, and local. Uh, that, because local, they understand the community best, as do the states. And the state and the federal governments have the funding to distribute to local governments to the schools. So a multilateral approach, I think, is best. The president announced in 2012 an initiative to sponsor and support civic education in schools. Uh, but subsequent research on my part 
in the past month has turned up no results from that program. There's no follow through. So um, accountability for initiatives by the administration is definitely something that could be helpful in solving this problem. Um, with the economy, the way it is, families aren't focused on talking about affairs. They're focused on trying to put food on the table. So it, schools have to be the solution here. Mm -hmm. So supporting civic education in our schools and making it a consistent part of their curriculum from beginning to end can really help the problem. All right. Rachel, in the uh, civic participation poll, just over half of respondents said voting is the best way to affect change. But only 39% of people between 18 and 34, your generation, said voting made much difference. So, as a millennial, what explains this and does this bode ill for the future of our democracy? Thank you. There is a large gap between Americans ages 50 and older and my generation, the so-called millennials, ages 18 to 34. We have technological advancements such as Twitter and other areas to get our vote out there or to get our thoughts out there. Whereas Americans 50 and older, they were taught vote, get your voice out there. That is the way to affect change. Nowadays, with Twitter and among other things, I'm an optimist about this. There is a way that we can improve voting in the future. Politicians nowadays are paralyzed by the, the, this lack to get stuff done, the gridlock in the White House. While millennials, we might be not enthused by the long lines or um, the lack of initiative, I have hope for the future that with techn technological advancements, we can improve voting and um, get things done faster. All right, well maybe um, what the millennials would do is go around Washington and just do, get it done themselves and not, not wait. Yes. Um, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm hoping on. <laughs> um, Allison, um, only about 51% of the respondents in the civic confidence poll believe the American system gives them an opportunity to succeed. What does that say then about your generation's future prospects? Well, with those results, it was easy to be glass half empty, you know, only 50% or so are kind of optimistic about where we're going or what our current status is. But when we looked closer at the data and answers from specific demographic groups, I think it was, it pointed out some current issues in our country. Almost 20% drop from male to female in their um, confidence in the American system. So, and their ability to be successful. Women do not feel that the system is allowing them the same opportunities in comparison to what men felt. I know there's a lot in the current climate about that. Mm -hmm. So I, I really am optimistic that that can be changed for the future and women can feel that they are just as equal and they have the same opportunities in the future as well. And I know I'm gonna continue what we keep saying. Lower education people, or people with lower levels of education did not feel that they had the opportunity to be successful either. And there are many jobs that go unfilled because there are not enough trained candidates or um, educated candidates for that. So I think if we can find ways to make higher education or more training available, that they can feel that they are more successful. And now, more now successful. interestingly, Hispanic Americans were the most optimistic about their future mm -hmm. prospects, and yet um, the, it was the Hispanic Americans who gave the most um, incorrect answers. So what do you make of that? Well, in the past couple of decades, there has been a large wave of immigration from Latin America, and whether these respondents have been personally affected by themselves immigrating here or by friends and family, I think they have come to a place with high hopes and a lot more optimism and seeing the better opportunities they have here and they're striving for a better life here in our country. Whereas maybe black and white um, Americans who have been born here are taking for granted what they've had in this country all along. And I think it's easy for them to feel a little more pessimistic about our country. Mm. All right. Well, Cecilia, in all four polls, uh, as, as the income and education levels increased, so did the ability to answer correctly. Um, a lot of polls pick that up. But um, what does this say about the role that income plays in getting the education needed to participate in our civic society? Well, I think those results kind of hit us close to home because we are undergraduates. 
So, and I can't speak for anyone else on the Pullman unit, but um, I was talking to Paula earlier and I took out student loans to get through my undergrad. And when I start my graduate program in the fall, I'm going to be taking out more student loans. And so that says a lot about how expensive a college education is and how you can't buy your civic knowledge. You have to have a higher education to do that. And so college is expensive and people don't have the income to get it. So it's sometimes very inaccessible. And I think that makes a huge difference in the way people understand our civic society. Mm. Sounds like we're gonna have to work on our education system. <laughs> Uh, Mason, in the um, civic knowledge poll, I noticed some pretty big gaps between the knowledge levels of men and women, and it pains me so much to see this. So men more than women knew how large the national debt is, they knew what the Federal Reserve is, they knew what branch of government can declare war, and on and on. So um, what's up with this gender gap? Right, I thought this was uh, really interesting. I think one thing I want to mention is that this test of knowledge that we've created is not fully comprehensive of all the knowledge we think, <laughs> we think as, an, as uh, Americans need to know. Uh, so one way to put it is with this, with this poll that we're, we've taken, we put our toe in the water to gauge the temperature, but the temperature may not be consistent throughout. Uh, in the same way that uh, on some questions men may know uh, may be more likely to answer, and on others, uh, women may know more. So on a few questions that you've mentioned, uh, the uh, difference between how men and women answered was significant. And one example that comes to mind is on the uh, war powers. We asked uh, which, I believe, which branch of government can declare war. And the correct answer is Congress. And men were more than or about twice as likely as women to answer that question correctly. So we, don't, we can't say for sure why on certain questions uh, men may be more likely to answer correctly, but uh, we'll be doing more polls in the, in the future, follow-up polls to this, uh, the ambassador's uh, classes and PICC, the polling unit, uh, we're hoping to continue this, and that'll be something we may uh, look into in the future. All right. Well, I'll get out there and have to do some prep with the, uh, the women respondents, I guess, huh? Um, all right, let's take a break. We have a question from the audience, please. Hello. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being here tonight and sharing your findings with us. Um, my question has to do with education. Uh, it, the education system for students and kids is already there, so we have a platform that we could change civics education for them. What do you think would be a good option, or what are options for adults that are already in the work world that don't necessarily want to go back to college to get a higher degree uh, to provide them with an opportunity to learn more about how they can be involved with civics engagement and be more involved with their government and politics. So instead of um, starting at the bottom and, and um, training <sighs> children or teaching children as they're yeah. going through the system, what do we do with people who are outside, outside yeah. the system now? Already and, out there yeah. and they want to learn Anybody more. Anybody want to take that? So Haley. I was thinking a lot about this and I think that the problem is politics are boring. So a lot of my friends that I talk to are saying, I don't want to hear about your class, I don't want to hear about that, it's just, it's boring, it's inaccessible, it doesn't make sense, why are people so mean in Washington, things like that. So I think the main problem is that it's inaccessible. I think that if politics is more fun, we have more Netflix shows like House of Cards. No. Um, I think if it's, if it's more fun and it's, it's more widely understandable, then a lot more people who have already graduated not in the education system will kind of latch on to it and they'll be more interested. It could even be a hobby of theirs to follow politics. And, and lastly, I think that it's just about having some sort of civic duty, a sense that being educated about your surroundings, about your community, and about your government is something that you need to do if you live here. It's something that is extremely important if you want to make a change. All right. I think, Cecilia? I think also kind of going off what Haley said, something Mason and I talked about when we were looking at our poll was you don't have to have money to participate in your society. Education may be a little far-fetched for some people who don't have a higher income, 
but you don't have to have money to participate. You can volunteer in your community, you can vote. There's so many different ways that you can be involved in our society without having money. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of, I think realizing that helps. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Rachel, when you talk about how optimistic you are, what, what role might technology play um, in helping to connect people who may be a little isolated, um, who aren't going through the education system now, um, and you know, can connect communities better and, and mobilize people better? Absolutely, thank you. Um, technology has an endless amount of information. You can get on Google, you can connect with people through social media sites. With that in mind, opportunities are endless. Because of this, you can find out ways to get involved, get enrolled in school, perhaps go on a college visit. It makes it far more accessible. When you have the internet and technology to connect you to places all over the world, from the United States to China, or perhaps from New York City to San Francisco, it creates a smaller world with more opportunities, and I think that's awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. So um, we have another question. We'll take another question, then we'll finish our, our questions here. Yeah. We have a question from Twitter. Um, all right. If you were giving policy advice to a presidential candidate based on this poll, what would be your top policy proposal? All right. That's a good question. That's a great question. Frank, you want to try that? Or Jonathan? Yeah? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's so hard because the amount of data that, you know, we had to go through, and one of the things that I thought would be interesting um, to look through the data is, is if I'm a presidential candidate, what is the ideal constituent? What is the ideal person? What, what is the background of the person that is most likely to go out and vote? What is the background of the person that is most likely to go out and donate money to get their friends to vote? And so, um, you know, if I was, if I was uh, um, giving advice to a candidate, it would, it would be just that, sifting through the data and seeing what are the things that I need to do to motivate people to turn out into the polls and to you know, vote for me. Because if you're, you know, if you're running an election, you obviously want to get the most amount of votes to win that election. And so um, that would be it. Voter turnout. OK. Yeah. Jonathan, what do you think? I think the top policy, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but it's education. Um, it was recently, recently been discovered by Pew, uh, the Pew Research Center, that millennials are the largest group of, like the largest generation in the workforce. We are taking over as, uh, as we get older. So to target millennials, create millennial-friendly policies, it, I think that's the most politically viable option. And education has been n number one in the hearts and minds of millennials everywhere. So I think that uh, producing that kind of policy, whether it's making education more attainable from uh, K through 12 to higher education, making it better, making it more attainable, making it more accessible, I think that should be a politician's top goal because even not just targeting millennials, but no one can really argue that education is bad. Mm. So there's no political loss there. Mm. But everybody can say it's good uh, and I'm for it, but uh, do you think you'll hear really practical, down-to-earth solutions for some of the things that you've been um, discovering through your poll? Uh, I don't expect to find them coming from the population, given that most people think that government doesn't regulate the internet. Um, but I do think that uh, politicians can work with think tanks. They can work with. They can look to other countries and model our education system to match American culture, American ideologies, mm -hmm. to the very best educational methods in the world. All right. So Haley. Mm -hmm. Um, in the civic participation poll, 82% of your respondents said they recycle, but only 20% said that they get around without a car. Does this make you optimistic or pessimistic about our stewardship of the environment? Well, as we know, Americans do not do a lot to protect our environment as it is. And when we look at the individual level, recycling is important, but it's not enough. We have to look to big businesses and to the government to make actionable policies that can actually help save our environment. And if it doesn't happen, then individuals in our society will have to make a huge lifestyle change in the next few decades. And that's not going to be fun for anyone. So it needs to start now, and it needs to start quickly. And probably the government needs to hire on more scientists and, and more advisors, and it needs to be an issue at the forefront. But however, it's uh, all about the money. As our CEO of, uh, founder of C-SPAN says, Brian Lamb, he always says it's all about the money. And it's really true. 
So the reason why we aren't having these environmental initiatives is because it's costly. There's not enough cheap ways to get around efficiently in electric cars. There's not enough cheap ways to recycle easily if you don't live near a recycling plant. So it, it really goes back to making things more accessible and affordable on the environmental front. And there needs to be more innovation, scientific advancements, and technology as well. Okay. Frank, there's been a debate raging for a long time, as you well know, over whether a college degree is worth the expense. Now, in the Civic Confidence poll, you had a, a plurality of your respondents, 40%, said they would recommend that an 18-year-old, given $50,000, spend it on education rather than to start a business or to invest in the market. So does that resolve the college cost-benefit question, if uh, most of the respondents? Um... I, I mean, I don't, I don't think it does. And I think a theme through our conversation here is that you know, we've, we recognize the importance of education and what some of the byproducts of being educated is, what, what, what that entails. It means you are partici participating more in your government. It means that you do tend to have a higher income. And you know, making that more accessible to people um, is something that uh, is a good thing. The problem with, with that, that arises is, is the cost-benefit question of, you know, is it worth me getting tens of thousands, in some cases, hundreds of thousand dollars in debt to receive a degree um, you know, where once I get that sheep skin, I'm not even guaranteed a job, you know, and it's almost just putting you at par with the rest of the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think the question solves um, the debate, but um, I think it's, it's starting a conversation that uh, will help lead to a lot of mm -hmm. good solutions. Okay. Um, all right. Now I want to ask a couple of you um, the same question, and I want to start with Allie. Um, how did your participation in this poll help you in thinking about your career, or um, how will it help you in your career? Because you do have a, a, a position already. Yes, after graduation, I will be working on Capitol Hill as a staff assistant, legislative correspondent. So that's in the government, and it's in the, it's part of Congress, which is uh, the least trusted branch of government, according to our <laughs> poll. So <laughs> really encouraging, but. Um, <laughs> Next year, those results are going to go up. Yes, <laughs> yeah, no, hopefully I can have it. No. Um, the polling unit really taught us hard work, a lot of hours, and the importance of knowing what the American public population feels, thinks, knows, is doing. And as a, a congressman, congresswoman, you need to know how your constituents are feeling. Mm -hmm. So for my career path, that was really important. Um, specifically, as part of PICC as a whole, we learned how to network. We learned how to act professionally. We learned just kind of real world experience. This kind of was a classroom, but this isn't what a normal college class does. Mm -hmm. We got this real world experience that no one else got. And as President Daniel said in his open letter in January, he doesn't just want Purdue students and other college students to be the brightest and hardworking. He wants them the most prepared. Yeah. And by going through PICC and pulling unit, we got that out of class preparation that I don't think any other organization I knew of could give me. Haley, I want to hear your thoughts on the same question. How did this help you in thinking about uh, the work world? How did it um, uh, help you in thinking about uh, teamwork or uh, relationships with your other students because you all had to pull together? What are your thoughts? Well, I think the most, the biggest takeaway for me is the way that we all interacted in our classroom. So in our space at Purdue, we have a long conference table and we all sit around it and it was a brainstorming session every time. But we also had so much respect for each other and we all listened to each other's ideas and we all really understood where each other were coming from. And by valuing everyone's different backgrounds and their majors, we were able to create this really well-rounded poll. And from that, I feel like I'm very prepared to go into conference rooms in my future job. And I'm really a lot more confident. I think I can speak up with a lot of confidence. And I can be the person in the room that says, we need to look at this again. We need to go over this. Uh, this doesn't seem right. And through the Purdue Institute for Civic Communication, I have had the best opportunity 
And I would not have had that if I didn't join the PICC. So that was probably the biggest takeaway. So Jonathan, I'm going to um, close it with you because this uh, is right in your sweet spot, right? You, uh, you're in political science. Yes, and ma'am. so do you think you want to do polling or you want to not do polling? Well, uh, it made me, con- doing this experience made me consider polling for about five minutes and then I realized my heart wasn't in it for a professional experience. But as far as an academic experience, it's certainly worthwhile. Uh, more interested in other efforts to improve democracy than evaluating. Okay. We have another question from the audience, please. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, I attend the University of California, Riverside. I'm here on a UCDC program. And um, I'm curious to know where all of your interest in politics and government started, because across the board, I kind of hear a lot of emphasis um, on the government. And I'm um, wondering if, if any of the questions that you asked in your polls correlated with the family structure of those individuals. Um, because I feel like as millennials, uh, our generation seems to put a lot of emphasis on the government and not so much as the home. And I was always taught that a government powerful enough to give you everything you want is a government strong enough to take away everything you have. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on some of the responsibility being placed within the home versus um, just relying solely on the government to Mm -hmm. educate us. And um, Mm -hmm. Good good question. Yeah, anybody want to take that? Individual responsibility, family responsibility, or Mason? Well, uh, I think one thing I'd say is that education doesn't necessarily have to come from the government. And I know that um, we have may have mentioned uh, uh, policies uh, might be useful to, uh, government policies might be useful, but um, uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, education doesn't necessarily have to come from the government and um, as far as the family uh, aspect to it, uh, that's really important. Uh, I think knowing where, your, uh, where you get your ideas and your biases, uh, and a lot of that comes from your family, is important. Uh, and that can also be useful. Uh, I'm an engineer. Uh, my dad was an engineer, I think very analytically, I think. And uh, I think knowing that helps me interact with the people around me who aren't necessarily as analytically focused as me. Okay. Anybody else want to take that one? Yeah, Cecilia? I think um, as far as family goes, before I came to Purdue, I wasn't necessarily interested in politics or government. Um, and not everyone is as lucky as I am to have parents who educated me at home before I went to school about you know how the government works and what's important. and. You know, not only does my dad work with the State Department, but before he took that job, my parents educated me at home. And so, like what you said, um, and kind of going off what Mason said, education doesn't necessarily have to come from school or the classroom or the government. It, there's a big responsibility for your family to also help you through that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Frank, did you want uh, to add? I, I guess to, to add to that, I would just uh, say that uh, it's the role of the government to uh, make sure that education is accessible for people, you know, and uh, that the best education would, would be the ones where the individual is out seeking it themselves and kind of not just having it be applied um, to them, whether through a third party or, or for, from their parents. Okay, thank you. We have another question? Yes. First of all, as a Purdue alumni, I got it. this is one of the coolest events ever. Glad that Purdue's really? finally doing practical education. You're biased. Uh, <laughs> but I am biased. Uh, no, but one question, you know, so I work in public policy in D.C., and one of the questions we're always trying to crack is, you know, we do a lot of polling, hear the same things about education. Education, ed- how do you, you know, and you guys seem like some of the smart minds currently in school is like, how do you make it more accessible? You know, candidly, I grew up in southern Indiana, financed my whole education. I found it very accessible. You know, and I paid it for my own. You know, how do you, you guys keep saying more accessible. You know, what do we do? What are some potential solutions there? You know, do, do, do we pay for everybody to go to med school? I mean, what are the limitations? Right. and where does the money come from? It all comes down to the money. Well, um, uh, times have changed since when you went through, um, since when you went through <laughs> Purdue. About five years ago. Education, right, about five or ten years ago when you went through. He had to walk ten miles to get to his class from his yeah. Uphill both ways. Uphill both ways. Uh, but 
the, the cost of education has skyrocketed, and there's no denying that. It's outpaced inflation by, I think, 300 percent is that's some, of the, some of the figures, hundreds of percent, uh, which means more than triple the rate, double the rate, depending on your figures, who you ask. Um, but the point is it's astronomical. And as it seems as you make federal aid more available, colleges continue to raise their rates because they're providing more student services. And not only that, states are contributing fewer dollars per student to institutions. And that makes, that makes it really hard for institutions to provide uh, scholarships. So I think we need kind of a cultural shift where you know, at Purdue we have a lot of programs where agricultural companies will come into the College of Agriculture and while they do kind of you know, produce a department that is a, it's very friendly to the company, but they fund students' educations who show promise. And I think we need more of that where the private sector takes on responsibility for creating it, the next generation of managers, scientists, engineers, writers, everybody. So producing more scholarships at that level, uh, producing more grants can be helpful but from the federal government, but that's just more taxpayer dollars. There's a lot of money sitting in the private sector that can go into investing in education, which can produce more talented, more educated people, which will then in turn produce more revenues to continue. It, it's a self-sustaining cycle, in my view. Okay. All right. Yeah, oh, and just, Frank, we, you and I were talking yeah. earlier about some things along these lines. What Absolutely, are your... and, and just to dovetail off that point, you know, I think it's, it's, it's unique things like what we did at Purdue uh, maybe two years ago where um, President Daniels wanted to freeze tuition. It's those kinds of steps where you know, uh, universities or higher education institutions are saying, you know what, we're going to have our budget match what uh, we're going to be getting in you know, X amount of years, we're not gonna uh, just increase the budget, you know, with, with what we wanna do. Uh, but also, you know, another way to help um, make education more accessible is having more online classes, um, you know, for that, you know, single mother who is trying to, you know, work during the day and go to school at night, making that more accessible to where she can, you know, go to school or attend class where it is, um, you know, favorable mm -hmm. to her schedule, it's doing things like that. Also making sure that students graduate on time. You'd be surprised with the amount of students who do not graduate within four years. It's something like 69% mm -hmm. at Purdue University alone where students aren't receiving their degree on time. So mm -hmm. it's well, what about What about um, three-year degrees? Three, oh, yeah, absolutely. Having, I mean, making you know, it possible for you know, students to graduate within three years by opening up more summer courses. Um, mm -hmm. It's those kinds of things to where those are the steps, that's the direction that we need to start moving into. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, President Daniels recently came out with an op-ed discussing this invest in a Boilermaker program. So, Jonathan, piggybacking off what you said about private sector investment in our students' education, is the Daniels plan a viable alternative to funding higher education? I think at this point, anything that can help is viable. Uh, it, we're pretty deep in the hole. Student debt is it's growing by the year, again, outpacing inflation. I think that the plan that uh, President Daniels outlined is that an individual who finds enough money, uh, more than what he or she knows what to do uh, with, and magnanimity uh, for students uh, can invest in their education, uh, pay for their education, pay for tuition, pay for books, possibly help with housing and other costs associated with higher education, and in return, take a percentage off of their salaries after they come out of college and when they receive gainful employment after they graduate. And such a plan does pose a lot of ethical questions of who should pay for education, but such a plan can be helpful with enough evaluation and that if, if, if it's a family-based decision that they enter into this contract with an, with an alum of the university, just an interested donor, um, then that's not just simply someone trying to take advantage of an 18-year-old who's desperate to make his way and make his or her way in the world, but it's just an opportunity to help those in need. So I think his plan, I think Daniels's plan, can, President Daniels's plan can be viable, um, not on a very large scale, but it can start small and every little step helps. So um, in case you haven't caught into this, um, the students pretty much agree that in order to improve civic knowledge and civic participation and confidence in our civic institutions. It all starts with education um, and uh, it's, it's a prerequisite. And so um, I, if, if there's any bottom line here, I think that's, the, that, that's it. I think we have time for one more. 
Rachel, this question is actually for you on participation. Um, do you believe that slacktivism, which would be the act of tweeting or sharing a Facebook post um, in support of a cause, um, really has any effect on change? For example, you know, retweeting a hashtag, does that equal showing up to a rally or voting on a policy? Thank you. It's interesting because you'll see these hashtags, you'll see people tweeting and all of this information overload on social media. I would argue, yes, it can have an impact. And yes, this can lead to more social movements and protests. It, it's crazy how one hashtag in a tweet can go live. What you say on your social media sites can go viral. It can spiral in effect. And I do believe that can lead to change. Whether that's good or bad, I can't say. I am an optimist, so I always hope it's good. However, it can also lead to um, some things in the future that can be scary. But yes, I do believe social media and tweeting and this thing called slacktivism can affect change. OK. So social media can be both our friend and our uh, enemy then. Yes. Huh? Yes. All right. Well, thank you. I think that's it. That wraps it up, unless anybody else uh, Good evening. My name is Liz Bitzer, and I'm a senior studying public relations and strategic communication. On behalf of the polling unit, thank you for being a wonderful audience. We'd also like to thank Paula Dwyer for being a wonderful moderator. This is the first polling project, and it was a very unique learning experience. We were able to grow in an unusual kind of classroom setting, and we all grew as individuals. We have great gratitude to our friends at C-SPAN. Here tonight are Susan Swain and Rob Kennedy, co-CEOs, and Brian Lamb, founder and executive chairman. Also, one of our favorite teachers at Purdue, Steve Scully, and all the C-SPAN executives and staff who always have time for that, us. Let's give them a hand right now. Without the constant leadership and support, guidance and encouragement from the PICC Executive Director, this presentation, this poll, and this hands-on learning opportunity would not have been possible. We hope that you all were intrigued and excited by our findings and follow the new results next year. We would now like to invite you to attend the reception located in the National Rotunda, hosted by the Purdue Alumni Association. Thank you, and boiler up. <laughs>